Budapest, 1944. Just months before D-Day, Nazi executioner Adolf Eichmann summons Joel Brand, a Jewish underground leader, to his office. Acting on orders from Heinrich Himmler, Eichmann makes Brand a remarkable offer. He is willing to trade the lives of one million Jews for 10,000 trucks. Brand is instructed to fly to Istanbul and contact the Allies. He leaves behind his wife, Hansi, and his close friend, Dr. Rudolf Kastner, to continue negotiation with Eichmann. Brand is soon detained by the British in Syria. Hansi and Kastner are left to play a deadly game of poker with Hitler's Grim Reaper. At stake are the lives of hundreds of thousands of Hungarian Jews, and all the bids are bluffs. Besides hiding the truth from the SS, Hansi and Kastner must hide their passionate affair from the world. Many thousands of lives are saved. The pending deportation of Budapest Jews is stopped. Yet, in post-war Israel, the most unsung hero of the Holocaust, Rudolf Kastner, is assassinated by fellow Jews for having sold his soul to the devil. This is a visual companion to the screenplay by Leo Zahn. Throughout Europe in 1942 and 1943, in all of Nazi-occupied territories, Jews were rounded up, herded into ghettos, and deported to concentration camps. However, one country remained an island of peace, Hungary. The Hungarian Jews were able to live almost normal lives. Budapest, the Paris of the East, was a thriving city. Hansi Hartmann, while in her 20s, had started her own glove manufacturing business. In 1935, she married Joel Brand, a refugee from Germany. A clever organizer and socially well-liked man, Joel joined the Hansi's firm as a salesman. The Brands had two children and lived a middle-class life in Budapest. But when Hansi's sister was caught in a roundup of undocumented Jews and deported to the Ukraine, Hansi and Joel hired a smuggler to bring her back. One rescue led to another, and within a year, the Relief and Rescue Committee, also known as VADA, had grown into a sizable organization. VADA's backbone was a network of couriers and smugglers, mostly German military intelligence officers, who could be bribed for reasons other than their opposition to Hitler. The son of a moderately prosperous wine merchant, Rudolf Kastner was, at the time, an up-and-coming lawyer and journalist. he just wooed and married Boyo Fischer, the beautiful daughter of the richest and most influential Jew in town. But he also made enemies. Kastner's passion was politics. He was an energetic Zionist youth leader, more a fixer than a pioneer. Kastner moved from his hometown in Romania to Budapest. He joined the rescue committee. Kastner and Joel became fast friends. At the same time, Kastner felt a strong attraction to Hansi. He courted her for a long time while silent about his marital status. Hitler ordered the occupation of Hungary. Many Hungarians were happy to cooperate with the occupying power. Hard on the heels of the troops came Gestapo officer Adolf Eichmann, who had already masterminded the deportation of millions. And almost all of Europe had been emptied of Jews by 1944. Only one country with a significant Jewish community evaded Eichmann's handiwork, Hungary. With the Red Army approaching Hungary's eastern border, Hitler worried that the Hungarian government would attempt to negotiate its own peace. March 19, 1944, Germany seized Hungary. By the end of the month, 
Eichmann arrived in Budapest personally to take charge of the deportation of Hungary's Jews. Between May 15th and August 15th, approximately 475,000 Jews were deported in about 170 train loads of Hungarian Jews sent to their death camps at Auschwitz. Altogether, the last great bloodletting of the war is this effort by Eichmann to murder the Jews of Hungary. Within weeks, Jews were wearing the yellow star. Hungarian police and the Gestapo were arresting Jews and herding them into ghettos. However, Eichmann did not close down the Jewish Help and Rescue Committee and allowed them to keep their offices in Budapest. By the spring of 1944, it was pretty obvious that uh, Nazi Germany was in deep trouble. I think that what Himmler wanted to do was to prepare options for Hitler to choose from. One such option was to get in touch with the Western powers. Himmler had his reasons for choosing a bunch of unknown and powerless Jews as a channel to the Western Allies. If they could show the Nazis that they were in contact with their brethren and sisters in the Allied countries, were in fact the representatives of the world Jewish conspiracy, an international power of the greatest uh, force. I mean, this idiocy was believed in. And so it's quite, uh, quite uh, logical for Himmler to have uh, tried to negotiate via people who pretended that they were representatives of that force. A few weeks after his arrival in Budapest, Eichmann summoned Kastner's colleague, Joel Brand, to his headquarters at the Hotel Majestic. Quite unexpectedly, Eichmann made the most extraordinary offer. When he was put on trial in Jerusalem after the war, his words were quoted by Joel Brand. Er hätte mich rufen lassen, um mir ein Geschäft vorzuschlagen. Er war bereit, mir eine Million Juck zu verkaufen. Wette für Mut, Mut für Wette. Das war ihm sein Stimmfall damals. Eichmann was offering to release a million people for 10,000 lorries. This was really a ploy by Himmler to make contact with the British and the Americans. When I came to the city, I saw him standing on the ground with his hands and his hands and his hands. You know who I am? I went to all the actions against the Jews in Germany, in Austria, in Austria, in Poland, in Slovakia. עליי הוטל לבצע את הפעולות גם נגד יהודי הונגריה. בדקתי את הקשרים שלכם עם הג'וינט ועם הסוכנות היהודית, ואני רוצה להציע לכם עסקה. איזו עסקה שאלתי? סחורה תמורת דם. דם תמורת סחורה. כך הוא אמר לי. אני מוכן למכור לך מיליון יהודים, נשים שמסוגלות ללדת, גברים שמסוגלים להוליד. זקנים, ילדים, אתה תחליט, אתה תבחר. הייתי המום. דבר! הוא צרח. אמרתי לו שאין לנו סחורות, אין לנו, אין לנו רכוש, הלוא אתם החרמתם הכל. אני צריך עשרת אלפים משאיות, אלף טון קפה ומאתיים טון סבון. צא אל הידידים שלך באיסטנבול, תמורת מיליון יהודים הם ישיגו הכל. אני הקמתי את ועדת ההצלה בבודפשט, יחד עם הנזי. הנזי ואני התחלנו את המסע ומתן עם האס-אס. ראז'ה נלווה אליי לפגישות האלה עם ביסטיציאני וקרומאי בתור העוזר שלי. עד שיום אחד הזמין אותי אייכמן למשרד שלו. אותי, לא אותו. és akkor bemutatott engemet Tusznak. És hogy tudja meg, hogy ami elmegy jó élevel a feladattal, ez a rejtnek a titka, a 
a német állam titka, és erről nekem nem szabad senkivel beszélni, és nem szabad nekem erről senkinek semmit sem mondani. The instruction to Eichmann came from Himmler. That I know for absolutely sure, absolutely certain. So this was highest level uh, contacts. And my view is that the central task there was not that of Joel Brandt, but of Bandy Gross. Precisely because he was a little smuggler and, and, and criminal and so on. Precisely because of that. He was charged with creating a, a situation in Switzerland where uh, high officials of the SS would meet in the first instance with high officers of the American Office of Strategic Services, the spy agency of the Americans, in order to prepare or lay the ground for a separate peace between Germany and, uh, and America. Peret Reves, a refugee from Slovakia, was at that time working with the Hungarian Rescue Committee. It was unbelievable. Eichmann was for us Lucifer, to, to Satan, to se ne da vipio, and to me, no človek mjero zeo, kolena se mu potrasli, gdje se mluvi, do to je Eichmann. A naraz Eichmann prosi Branda. Tak sme mluvili, no co to može bit? Može to bit, že to je nejaka. Joel Brand left Hungary to find out if the Western Allies were interested in Eichmann's approach. Joel was given two weeks for his mission. Upon his arrival, there was no visa in his name. Members of the Jewish agency were disorganized and in constant disarray. Still, the Eichmann proposal did reach the Allies. Roosevelt sent Ira Hirschman to Turkey to meet with Joel. The British were against any discussion of the plan. They suspected Joel of being a German spy and arrested him in Syria. By the time Hirschman caught up with Joel, he was under British house arrest in Cairo. I said, well, I don't, can't do anything about trucks. We're not going to give the enemy uh, uh, equipment. I can't get our, uh, our uh, collaborators in this war to give, uh, give uh, equipment to the enemy. But money, yes, we can make some deal. I said, now, how about these men, Eichmann and the men around him? Uh, can't we do some bribery? Were they, uh, they approachable? And uh, Brand looked at me and said, are, 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 you, are you kidding? He said, they can all be bought. You are dealing, you, you, you're, you're dealing with, with men of the lowest uh, character. You're dealing with bandits. Oh, Brand. She got the Khalid. What happened? When I worked with the Khalid, I was arrested by the British. היה לי דרכון גרמני, והם יכלו לעשות בי מה שהם רוצים. ומה קרה לשליח הסוכנות שליווה אותך? גם הוא נעצר? לא, הוא יצא לחפש סבל כדי לקחת את המזוודות שלנו. ובדיוק באותו הרגע אתה נעצרת. איזה צירוף מקרים מוזר. כן. ולא חשדת אף פעם ששליח הסוכנות הוא שמסר אותך לבריטי? אני לא יודע. After his arrest in Aleppo, Syria, Joel was forced to observe the unfolding of the Hungarian nightmare from a jail cell in Cairo. The British interrogated him for many months. הוא הקשיב בשקט, ובסוף הוא אמר, ואם הוא ימכור לי מיליון יהודים, מה אני אעשה איתם? איפה אני אשים אותם? The official reaction of the Anglo-American Air Force Command to the desperate police for help was as follows. It is not contemplated that any units of the armed forces will be employed for rescue of victims of enemy oppression unless such rescue is the direct result of military operations conducted with the objective of defeating the enemy forces. Such operation would also divert our air force from important industrial targets and our planes would have to risk a 2,000 mile flight.
יומיים אחרי שיואל עזב, נעצרנו על ידי ההונגרים, דוקטור קסנר ואני. שבועיים נחקרנו במרתפים שלהם. הם עינו אותי במכות, בחשמל, בסיגריות בוערות. הם רצו לדעת למה יואל נסע לטורקיה ואיזו עסקה סגרנו עם האס-אס. עד היום יש לי צלקות על הרגליים. במשך כל זמן העינויים האלה אני חשבתי לעצמי, למה, למה הגרמנים לא גילו שום דבר להונגרים? הרי עד אז הם הרגו יהודים ביחד, בשיתוף פעולה. והתשובה היחידה הייתה ש... אולי הפעם הגרמנים באמת מתכוונים לבצע את העסקה הזאת. קסנר וחבריו ידעו שחייהם היו חייהם 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 חייהם. ואז פרשיה גרו, קסנר הפכו יותר ויותר לחנזי. הם הפכו אהבה. אני הייתי אמרת, אני הייתי אמרת. הם צריכים את עצמם. זה כבר דירקטיב. היא הייתה רודולף קאנצלר. Sometimes he lost courage whilst negotiating with Eichmann and small wonder. But she always sent him back into the fray. You must carry on. You can't give up now. In mid-May, Eichmann began to deport Jews to Auschwitz. 12,000 a day. Misinformation was widespread. The SS had told them they were going to a Hungarian work camp. Kastner knew where they were really going, and it was against this grim background that his negotiations with Eichmann began. Kastner, who was often accompanied by Hansi, had no experience of negotiating with an executioner. Who had? And yet the stakes were incredibly high. At the start of this extraordinary relationship, Kastner was intimidated by Eichmann's display of power. Hansi told Kastner to be more assertive. Kastner had beklagt. Kastner complained Eichmann smokes all the time when we're talking, and I have to sit there without a cigarette, which annoyed him terribly. Why, she said, get out your cigarettes and smoke with him. Kastner took Hans's advice. Eichmann later commented, when he was with me, Kastner smoked cigarettes as though he were in a coffee house. While we talked, he smoked one aromatic cigarette after the other. He added maliciously, with his great polish and reserve, he would have made an ideal Gestapo officer himself. As he settled into his new role, Kastner began to negotiate more aggressively. Matters went so far that at one point Eichmann said, Mr. Kastner, you're taking too many liberties. I think I'll send you for a holiday in Auschwitz. It was a dispiriting struggle, as Hansi Brand recalled during the Eichmann trial. was wir einen Tag aufgebaut ha gehabt haben und hofften, dass wir haben etwas gemacht, als nächsten Tag war das null und niedrig. Dass wir keine Angst haben. Weil da, da wir haben nichts anderes gehabt, nur unsere Selbstsicherheit. Weil die waren überzeugt, dass die ganze Judentum, die Weltjudentum steht unter uns. Die sprechen immer so, die organisierte Weltjudentum. Yet for all his obstruction and threats, Eichmann knew that Himmler wanted him to keep in with Kastner. So Kastner had some leverage. Eichmann then offered to release a token number. They could go by train to the Jewish homeland in Palestine. The question now arose, who should travel. 
How should we make the choice? Go into the ghettos and ask who wants to come? That would have produced uproar. We couldn't do it that way. After the war, many survivors of the camps were angry with Kastner, particularly those from Cluj, his hometown. They complained that he had neither selected them for his train, nor warned them about Auschwitz. Those in Cluj lucky enough to be on Kastner's list were brought to Budapest. So were groups from other Hungarian towns. On the morning of June the 30th, SS guards escorted Kastner's people to an isolated goods station. The stage was set for the most remarkable rescue attempt in the history of the Holocaust. After shuffling for 24 hours from one Budapest goods station to another, the Kastner train finally departed. Those who'd boarded couldn't be sure where the train was going. Eichmann thought there was little point in releasing Kastner's people when the Germans had so far received nothing in return, so he diverted the train northwards. After three days, the train stopped, and everyone was ordered off again. They were locked up behind barbed wire, locked up for so long that one of them had time to draw pictures of their new prison, Bergen Belsen. Bergen Belsen was not an extermination camp, nor was it the disease-ridden hell it was to become a year later. At that time, it held people the Nazis might want to exchange or release. Even though Budapest was now within reach of American air raids, a German defeat was far off. Eichmann was still pressing on. With amazing rapidity, he had already deported more than 400,000 to Auschwitz, more than half the Jewish population of Hungary. Kastner was desperate. In August, he wrote to a friend, after three and a half months of bitter negotiation, I feel I'm watching the unfolding of a tragedy which is quite unstoppable. Kastner turned to another SS officer whom he hoped would have a better chance of influencing Himmler. A man who probably had blood on his hands, but who was now busy looting Jewish property. Even Jews who met Obersturmbannführer Kurt Becker couldn't deny that he had style. Becher war wie alle diese, die haben so außer Eichmann, die haben alle so ausgeschaut wie amerikanische Filmstars. Gewachsen und gut aussehend und immer gut angezogen. Höflich? Höflich. Aber jedenfalls, er hat die Leute schön ausgenützt. Und was er nehmen konnte von den Juden, hat er genommen. Aber er hat sein Wort gehalten und hat er den Juden geholfen. Becher was living in the home of the richest Jew in Hungary. At first, Kastner was unsure how to handle him. He once came back from Becher's office with an admission. He told Hansi Brand that he'd not dared disturb Becker's birthday party. Hansi said, take him some chrysanthemums. If Becker accepts them, you will be able to speak freely. The gesture worked. This relationship was to become critical to Kastner's efforts. At the end of July, news seeped through to Budapest of the British rejection of Eichmann's Jews for Lorries offer. The Times dubbed it monstrous. Von Herrn Dr. Kastner mit der, Jü mit der, mit den mit der jüdischen Seite in der Schweiz zu sprechen, im Interesse, dass noch mehr und viel mehr erreicht werden konnte. Das war das Ziel von Dr. Kastner. Von Anfang bis zum Ende, er wollte erreichen, dass möglichst viele Menschen geschützt wurden. Kastner was able to say, 
Unless you make a convincing gesture, no further negotiations are possible. And the gesture he had in mind was releasing his people in Bergen-Belsen and sending them to Switzerland. Obviously, that argument was sufficiently convincing for Becker to pass it on to Himmler. On the day of the release, Kastner was actually standing on another part of the Swiss-German frontier at the first of a series of meetings he had set up for Becher. The climax was a secret rendezvous in a Zurich hotel in November, where Kastner and his contacts produced an American diplomat, Roswell McClelland, for Becher to talk to. McClelland offered no trucks, but he flashed a $5 million check, actually uncashable under Becker's nose. I don't think money was the purpose at all. What Himmler really wanted is to have a ceasefire, an agreement with the Americans to stop the war in Europe, to turn German might against the great danger of Bolshevism from the East, hopefully with American help. The Jews of Budapest were the only large group of Hungarian Jews still in existence. Himmler kept cancelling plans to deport them. He was anxious to maintain his contact with the Americans, brokered by Kastner. Although many were to starve or be killed by Hungarian fascists, over 100,000 were still alive when the Red Army later took the city. It was Kastner who had kept the Swiss talks going. He had absolutely no power to deliver anything. The negotiation was the purpose of the negotiation, because while the negotiation lasted, the, the Budapest Jews were in Budapest and not in Auschwitz. So he could have done anything only to have another day of postponement. He never thought for a moment that he can deliver on the part of the Allies any sort of goods or promises. All he wanted was to win time, and he did. I, I wouldn't sit here alive. I believe from the documents that I saw that uh, these negotiations were one of the reasons, not the only one, but one of the reasons for Himmler's order not to deport the Jews of Budapest. You know, it was all prepared. They, they were going to be deported in two days' time. This is August 25, 1944. And it was stopped at the very last moment. And the Nazis in Budapest didn't understand why they were stopped. Kastner could have rested on his laurels, but he chose to leave Switzerland and go back to Germany to try and rescue more people. It was a tremendously heroic thing to do. Nobody forced him. He and his family were safe in Switzerland. To go back into that hell, he could gain nothing from it personally. With Germany close to collapse, Kastner's leverage had become very much stronger. Hitler had ordered that no concentration camp inmate should fall alive into Allied hands. Kastner began to pressurize Becher to save Jews in camps still under German control. Becker valued Kastner as a walking insurance policy for after the war. The closeness which developed between the two men during this period was to influence profoundly Kastner's destiny. We were friends. We were in Perdu. We had to be friends. I didn't say Herr Kastner, but I said Rudolf. When the war ended, Rudolf Kastner returned to Switzerland. Rather than looking to the future, he could not forget the past and what he'd achieved, saving nearly 2,000 lives and helping to save over 100,000 others. After the war, Joel and Hansi moved to Israel, followed by Kastner and his family. They were now parents and had been reconciled after his wartime affair with Hansi Brand. The former friends did not speak to each other for years.
Kastner was unaware how vulnerable he was, how his wartime actions could be misinterpreted. If Israelis were intolerant of Jews who had not resisted the Nazis, how much more antagonistic would they be towards a Jew who'd negotiated with the Gestapo? By 1954, Kastner was a government spokesman, and it was rumored he would be running for parliament as a Labour candidate at the next election. Labour, and in particular its leader, David Ben-Gurion, dominated Israeli politics. But Kastner's chances of advancement were suddenly jolted by a libelous article penned by Malchiel Grunwald, a shady figure on the fringe of right-wing politics. He accused Kastner of collaborating with the Nazis and of testifying in favor of Becher in Nuremberg after the war. At the time, the accusation seemed absurd. But the Attorney General decided the state should sue. Kastner looked forward to telling the public, at last, what he had achieved. But two formidable figures hoped to use the trial to attack Ben-Gurion and the Labour government. Shmuel Tamir, Grunwald's attorney, was a very resourceful lawyer. Uri Avneri was an influential journalist. I was the editor of a news magazine which was in uh, extreme opposition to the government. The government was Ben-Gurion. Uh, so we decided to draw attention to this trial. We, in our weekly magazine, we gave it as much exposure as we could. And I was there every day following it. The trial opened in 1954 in Jerusalem under Judge Benjamin Halevi. Tamir was quick to raise the question why Kastner had not warned his fellow Jews that they were going to be deported to Auschwitz. Tamir wrote many articles in Avneri's magazine during the trial. The impact was huge.
נדמה לי שהיא לא הייתה צריכה להעיד היום. היא צריכה לשמוע את כל העדויות כדי לדעת מה להגיד בעדות שלה. יש לך מספיק הזדמנויות לעדכן אותה. בודיו! אני לא מבינה למה כולם צריכים לראות אתכם יחד. היא הלכה איתי לכל הפגישות עם אייכמן. אם מאשימים אותי במשהו, היא אשמה בדיוק כמוני. בודיו. במקרה בדיוק עכשיו היא שלחה את בעלה לחוץ לארץ. מה שהיה לי איתה בבודפשט נגמר. אני נפגשתי איתה כאן רק בענייני המשפט. בוודאי. הקולונל קורט בכר מן האס-אס אמר לי במפורש שהימלר עצמו עומד מאחורי העסקה הזאת. אני לא חושב שהימלר נעשה אוהב יהודים, אבל המלחמה התקרבה לקיצה, הגרמנים ידעו שהם מובסים, ולא היה להם שום ערוץ לדבר עם בנות הברית על שביתת נשק. פרנד אומר שהוא נשלח להשיג עשרת אלפים משאיות. אתה אומר שאייכמן שלח אותו לנהל משא ומתן עם בנות הברית על שביתת נשק? אני חוזר על מה שאמר לי הקולונל בכר. הימלר תכנן לנהל משא ומתן עם בנות הברית על הצלת יהודים תמורת עשרת אלפים משאיות. אבל המטרה העיקרית שלו הייתה לנצל את המשא ומתן הזה למגעים על שביתת נשק. אתה טוען ברצינות, דוקטור קסנר, שלהימלר לא הייתה שום דרך לפתוח במשא ומתן עם בנות הברית, אלא באמצעותו של יואל ברנד? כן, אדוני. אינני בטוח שהבנתי אותך, דוקטור קסנר. הימלר היה זקוק למברנט כדי לפתוח במשא ומתן עם מדינות המערב על שביתת נשק? כן, אדוני. שגריר גרמניה בשוויץ, למשל, לא היה יכול היה לפנות אל שגריר ארצות הברית בשוויץ? אני מזכיר לבית המשפט שבוועידת טהרן התקבלה החלטה מפורשת של בנות הברית לא לנהל שום משא ומתן עם גרמניה. אף פעם. אם קסלר עשה איזו עסקה אחרת עם אייכמן? אם הוא נתן משהו בתמורה ליהודים ש... שיצאו ברכבת? אייכמן הציע את העסקה הזאת לי. קסטנר רק עזר לי. אני עבדתי עם קסטנר יותר משנתיים בהצלה, ולמרות החזירות שלו, ולמ... הוא עשה הכל, מכל הלב ומכל הנשמה, כדי להציל יהודים, ולא רק את אלה שיצאו ברכבת. הוא שלח 18,000 יהודים לווינה, הוא הציל 180,000 יהודים בגטו בודפשט. Tamir then started to unravel Kastner's relationship with Kurt Becher. Tamir said, uh, you agree, Mr. Kastner, that the SS was a criminal organization? Of course. He said, do you agree that every uh, superior officer in the SS was a war criminal? Of course. Then, and you agree that anyone who would help an, a superior SS officer must be a criminal? I think at that moment, Kastner started to realize that he had got into a trap, but he couldn't get out of it anymore. He said, yes. And he said, then Tamir turned to the judge and said, may I have exhibit number so-and-so? And he said, oh, and he said, Mr. Kastner, do you know this document? Kastner became very, very pale, and he said, yes. Kastner had given an affidavit in favor of Becher to the denazification court in Nuremberg. He praised him as one of the few SS leaders who had the courage to oppose the program of annihilation. Kastner said privately that he'd done this to fulfill a promise he'd made to Becher. Helping a Nazi was bad enough, but Kastner had gone one step worse. Tamir's revelation about Becher was the turning point. It was now Kastner who was on trial. The public mood, egged on by Avneri's magazine, became ugly. When I heard that he had testified for Becher at Nuremberg, I said straight away, he'll get a bullet in the head. In June 1955, Judge Benjamin Halevi upheld the principal libels against Kastner. The judge concluded that in his view, Kastner had sold his soul to the devil. This caused an outcry. Shops refused to serve him. People spat in his face. Kastner was gunned down outside his flat by an extreme nationalist gang on March the 15th, 1957. He died 12 days later. <laughs> 